Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, guten tag. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here to our plenary session on creating livable cities in a changing urban landscape. I'm Melinda Crane and I'm very glad to be back in Leipzig and to be addressing a topic that is of recurring interest here at the International Transport Forum. Because urbanization, of course, is one of the key changes that we face across the globe. And transport is absolutely crucial to ensuring that cities which are facing explosive growth remain vibrant, inclusive, and dynamic, or in the words of our title, livable. Just a couple of statistics that I found while researching this panel that I thought I would share with you. According to one study, migration to urban areas is so massive that the world will need to build the equivalent of a city of one million people in developing countries every five days over the next 15 years to cope with that urban migration. Asia, of course, is at the forefront. Over a billion people will move to Asian cities in the next 15 years, and by 2025, Asia will have at least 10 megacities. But further urbanization is set to continue here in Europe as well. Just a reminder, 75% of Europeans already live in cities. That number is also likely to go up. And cities in Europe generate 85% of GDP. Across the globe, urbanization is generating pressing demands for solutions that ensure smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. This session will examine how urban transport policies can contribute to those solutions. And we begin now with a keynote from an economist who says that new and restructured cities will become our most important source of social progress. He runs the Urban Urbanization Project at New York University Stern School of Business. He has formerly taught at Stanford, and he is the person credited with inventing the phrase, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. He's been called one of America's 25 most influential people. A very warm welcome, if you would please, for our keynote speaker, Paul Roma. <laughs> welcome. So in the early 1800s, New York City faced challenges, not like the challenges here in Leipzig today, but closer to the challenges that are pressing in on developing uh, cities in the developing world, the ones that are experiencing this rapid influx. New York was attracting many immigrants, its streets were crowded, it was not able to, to deliver many of the services needed to maintain a productive work environment and a safe living environment. New York did something in, in 1811 that was truly remarkable and is, I think, a model for how we could think about uh, the approach that other cities could follow. They made a plan for taking most of the island of Manhattan, which was then not developed, it was just farmland with a few towns, a plan for laying out a street grid, avenues and streets, the rectangular grid that you're familiar with if you visited Manhattan, from roughly the area that we now know as Greenwich Village all the way up to 155th Street. This is a, was a remarkable plan in part because it took 100 years to build out all of the, the land that was part of the plan. It led to a seven-fold increase in the area of the, the city of New York. But it, and, and in so doing, it created opportunities for the millions of migrants who came to the United States through Ellis Island uh, to get their first job uh, to live in an urban area. This is the general strategy that will deliver progress throughout uh, the planet. We need to have cities that will welcome the billions of people who want to move to cities because of the new connections, the new possibilities that cities offer them. We've done this successfully in the past. We can do it again now. But we know that that freedom to move into a city and that freedom to interact, to pursue opportunity within the city can work for everyone only if it exists within a framework. 
and it's that tension between frameworks and freedom that I want to highlight today. We can use the grid that they surveyed in New York, which outlined the streets and avenues, which became the land which was seized by the government and protected as public space. We can use that as a metaphor for a framework. Within that framework, people could know where is the land where I could build a private building. They could develop residences, factories, uh, commercial uh, activity, and at that time, do it with quite a bit of freedom. There was very little, essentially none, of the kind of modern planning that would restrict land use or commercial and uh, locate commercial use versus uh, residential use. And over time, New York has been able to evolve as things change. The, the new buildings are torn down and new buildings are, are built. The existing structures can be repurposed. When most manufacturing left New York, many of the buildings which were once used as garment assembly sweatshops were converted into things like office buildings and uh, university laboratories at my university, NYU. In, uh, and that process of change continues. In lower Manhattan, areas that were once purely commercial are now being converted into residential use. Buildings that were designed as office buildings are being converted into condominiums. We're even reallocating some of the, of the street space that was set aside in the plan that was surveyed in, in 1811 for different uses. We're moving land from cars to buses to bikes and uh, pedestrians, even, even pedestrian plazas. Now, all of that flexibility, that freedom to adapt to a changing world was made possible by the framework of the public space that was surveyed and seized through eminent domain in 1811. And that framework has not changed. It probably never will change. In 1811, they didn't try and change the alignment of the streets to create more public space in lower Manhattan because that area had already been built, it was too late to change. But in Midtown, for example, which was part of this survey project, they were sure to leave aside 30% of the land as the public space that we now use for roads, sidewalks, or increasingly uh, pedestrian lanes, bike lanes, uh, pedestrian plazas and bike lanes. If you add the parks uh, as well, like Central Park, the public space increases to about 36% of the land. If you contrast that with other types of development, think of informal development, the favela, the slum, there we will typically see numbers as low as 5% of the land set aside as public space. And you can redevelop the buildings in a favela, but just as in New York or in lower Manhattan, it's very, very difficult to ever change the land, to increase the land that is set aside as public space, uh, to get more of that by tearing down buildings, realigning uh, the building fronts, and getting more public space. So the risk is, is that much of the development around the world now, instead of leaving options, as the planners in 1811 did in, uh, in Manhattan, the lack of a plan will constrain, severely constrain, the ability to have the public space that lets people move themselves around, move goods around, and uh, interact in their city. This is a, a very important priority as we think about this rapid pace of building of urban areas that Melinda uh, referred to, because, because it's, it's the case that we will probably never again, see the kind of uh, radical change in a city that, that Haussmann was able, able to bring about in Paris. So the decisions made now will have very long-lasting implications. What this points to is an interesting tension, a kind of a paradox in the dynamics of this changing world. The reason we can have so much freedom in many cases is because we have a framework that constrains all of those individual choices and makes sure they add up in a way which is beneficial for all. But then 
paradoxically, that freedom and that adaptability comes from these frameworks which are so difficult to change. And it's that tension that I want to elaborate uh, on this morning, or this afternoon. It's still morning in New York. <laughs> One simple lesson for uh, the developing uh, cities around the world is to try to do what New York did, set aside a generous allocation for this public space of mobility, to be sure, set aside land that can be used as parks as well, but just focus on the mobility alone and set aside that space, which could be used in so many different ways in the future. Before the development comes, it's not difficult to do. Governments can exercise public domain. In many countries, governments have title to the land. If there aren't squatters on the land, it's straightforward to stake and protect land. And the building of the roads, as in Manhattan, can be delayed for, for decades, uh, as long as a century. But the government must protect that public space so it's available when it becomes time to, to build on it. And recognize that in, in doing this, one never knows how that land will be used. In 1811, they had no idea what a car was or a bus, an internal combustion engine. They had no idea what an elevator was, but they had a sense that if there was this generous allocation of public space, however we would use it 200 years later, we'd be better off than, we started, uh, than if we started without it. So we have to set uh, these kinds of frameworks to have the freedom and the opportunity that, that cities can allow, and there is no option to delay. If we delay, a default framework, like the framework for public space that will emerge in a favela, will become the de facto framework. So we must make decisions under conditions of uncertainty, knowing that there is much that we don't know that we can't forecast, and that the best we can do is preserve options for those who come, who come after us. But there's a, another paradox here. The, the physical options that were available because of the wide avenues and, and streets meant that it was not a priority to limit access to those streets. So that in New York, as in many other places around the world, and especially in the United States, in the early stages of development, when the road space is, is ample, people are free to use that space with their automobiles, and then over time, they start to assume that they have a right to free access to, to road space. From the point of view of uh, the usual costs of free access, congestion, there's very little cost in the early stages. So you set aside the ample road space, you build it, it's used by wagons, then cars. Eventually then, you face a challenge. As the city thrives, the total population increases, the, built, uh, the floor area ratios go up, the, the amount of activity goes up, the demand for mobility goes up substantially, and soon you face the threshold where congestion starts to take off at this very nonlinear rate. You can no longer meet the demand for mobility by letting people freely use the limited space you have. What was a generous allocation of public space in the beginning increasingly becomes a very scarce, scarce amount of public space because you'll get more and more of everything else, but you won't get more land. So from this perspective, what's, what's bad about the automobile is not the freedom that it gives, which people clearly value, and it's not even the, the carbon that it emits or the energy that it uses, which might be addressed through other forms of power for, for vehicles. The problem with the automobile is it uses too much land. When you park it, when you drive it with a following distance, you just can't move enough people if you use that much land per person of the limited land available during rush hour in these cities. Now, we know as economists, we recommend systems that are, will, will address this problem of congestion, bring in some kind of a toll, a charge for using something scarce like, like land, and we rather cavalierly tell politicians to just start charging for the 
uh, the use of the roads at uh, the peak times when, when congestion becomes a problem. In so doing, I think we don't take enough account of the durability and persistence and slow change in these, in these frameworks. The framework here is not just the physical framework of the streets, but the notions of entitlement and right that people have built up. And it is very difficult to change those perceptions once they're, they're deeply entrenched. So if we could rerun history, we might imagine trying to set aside that generous public space in, in Manhattan, but perhaps from the very beginning do something like charge anyone who has a car a permit, make them buy a permit that they have to acquire before they can drive their car on the streets of Manhattan. Now, the cost of that permit might be very low in the early years. There might not be much demand for it. It could be close to zero. But it could change the perceptions about right and public versus private uh, opportunities. There could be a recognition that this is something which is valuable and you have to pay to use it. Then over time, once it becomes scarce, if the government lim uh, limits the number of permits at particular times to the number that can reasonably be sustained on, on a given grid, those permits will start to become more expensive. Done in the right way, the government can say, all we're doing is setting the quantities. We know from the streets and uh, the traffic uh, logistics how many permits we can give. If these permits are becoming more and more expensive, it's because of your fellow citizens bidding too much from them. It's not us, the government, trying to wage war on cars or trying to extract revenue from you, the poor, the leaguered taxpayers. Some cities have been able to bring in these kinds of permits, and I think they're a viable option, perhaps a more promising option, than just the straight congestion charging systems. And I think they give us some other alternatives that we could consider. Think about how willing people have been to accept the very inefficient systems of letting cars drive only on every other day, depending on whether the license plate is even or odd. You could sell permits in a, in a place like Shanghai or Singapore, where this permit gives you the right to drive every Monday, this one Tuesday. This permit gives you the right to drive only on Wednesdays between 10 a.m. And, and 2 p.m. You could have a whole collection of such permits and then someone who wants to be able to drive all, all week long, any time of the week, can buy the whole collection of permits. Someone who wants to aspire towards the freedom of owning a car and be able to undertake certain kinds of trips where the car is particularly valuable could have a permit for use on a particular day and concentrate all of the travel on, on that day. So there, in, under this kind of system, you don't have the silly inefficiency of somebody buying multiple cars to be able to drive all the time, and yet you still create a lower cost option for someone who wants the car to be able to use it sometimes to concentrate their trips during those times. So I think that if we think a little bit more cleverly about the fact that these frameworks, once set, have to persist for very long times and have to be designed to be acceptable to voters, not just to the, be acceptable to economists or the traffic engineers, we might, approach this, we might approach this problem differently. Moreover, we might even be able to accommodate some of the other concerns that are part of the framework of a city. So concerns about things like democratic equality. It may be important that there are some times when someone who is less affluent can drive on equal terms with someone who's, who's much more affluent. We may not want to have a city where the very rich can buy up all the permits, have unrestricted free travel on the streets, and uh, the, the middle class, the poor, cannot. So you might even set aside some days which are kind of the opposite of what some mayors are trying to do now. Instead of having the car free day, you might on Saturday, you might have the car with no permit day so that someone who wants a car, wants to be able to travel some, knows they can do it at least once a week on equal terms with everyone else. That will create congestion, it will cause problems. It'll mean that people will be queuing up for use of this scarce street space. But in terms of a society that values democratic equality and equal treatment, this might be a cost they're willing to, to bear to trade off the challenge between 
limiting the use of these scarce uh, roads uh, at certain times and giving everybody some kind of right to do some kind of, uh, to have some kind of use to this public space. You might do this for the same reason that we probably will not charge user fees to enter parks. This just violates a deeper part of our framework about equal treatment uh, for everyone in the public spaces. I think if we approach all of the challenges of transport and ur urban governance from this perspective, it will help guide us and it will particularly help us give advice to those countries and regions in the world which face a completely different challenge than the challenge in Europe right now. It's much more akin to the challenge of, of New York, but on a scale even New York couldn't imagine. There are billions of people who want the opportunities that come from being able to move into cities. Cities will expand rapidly. They'll expand along the lines of the favelas with the severely over-constrained, severely limited availability of, of public space, unless government actors make choices. They can make choices. They can make those choices knowing they won't be able to change them later and knowing that there's great uncertainty about how the city will evolve but they can do so in a way that leaves op options for future residents and, uh, and leaders in the city. And if they're particularly wise, they can create those physical options of the public space without creating the sense of entitlement, which can become a severe constraint on the policy options for, for leaders uh, later on. So to conclude, this framework of frameworks and, and freedom is the one we can bank on to keep progress moving around the world. And as we do this, we must keep in mind that assuring a steady inflow, a rapid inflow of people into urban areas is the most important priority ensuring progress for everyone. So in so doing, we must be very careful that our instincts about containing sprawl, about restricting certain kinds of choices, about limiting the freedoms about what can happen in cities. We must not let those well-intentioned inspirations about part of the detailed framework become barriers that stop allowed free mobility, tolerated, legalized free mobility into cities, and instead move towards the kind of legal free mobility that you can create if you do something like set a framework of surveyed dirt roads, turn things over to the private sector and say, do what you want with the freedom you have in this, in this private space. We, the leaders, will make changes over time with the public space and together we'll give you the same kind of opportunity that uh, immigrants to the United States had based on uh, decisions that were made as far back as 1811. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Paul Romer. I particularly uh, am intrigued by your emphasis on a rights-based approach and inclusion, and we're going to be picking up on a lot of those points in just a moment in our panel's discussion. But just a couple of follow-up questions, sure. if you would. First of all, starting with the question about concrete examples of some of what you were saying in terms of repurposing space in New York. I haven't been back to Times Square for a while, but I've heard that there are days on which I might not recognize it uh, when I do go back. That's right. The, there's the, the most surprising development is the plaza seating, that some of the experts uh, who were asked about this asked, uh, why would anyone want to sit in the street? Even sometimes plaza seating, like right by the Flatiron Building, uh, I think it's Madison Park there, uh, maybe Madison Square Park, uh, people couldn't believe that, more, that, that it made sense to take some street space out of Broadway and let people go sit in the street, but in fact, that's exactly what people like. They like being in the center of the action, not just sitting off in the park. But the fact is, um, trying to repurpose old cities often gives us rather piecemeal, uh, perhaps inelegant solutions. Now, I know that the Urbanization Project's latest initiative is to look at creating new cities because, quote, they offer uniquely important opportunities to implement reform and speed progress. Now, I have to say, when I think about creating new cities, I think about the new towns movement, and I wonder, isn't it always a temptation for planners to say, oh, let's forget the old, let's just start and build, the build it right from the ground up? 
the, the, the first thing is, is that I think some efforts have failed because they plan too much. That in this trade-off between the framework and the freedom, they have an, an extremely elaborated framework and leave very little freedom. So you want to be sure to have planning like the, the grid in, in 1811 in, in New York. But beyond that, whether it's planning for new space for uh, urban development, like the extension of Manhattan, or entirely new cities like Shenzhen, which is my favorite new city. In, in either one, um, the, the, the issue is, is that we have, there's no alternative but to have one or the other. That with the billions of people who are moving into cities, we can't simply densify the land that we have and make room for all of those people. So it isn't really a choice of fix what we have or create some new space. There won't be room for five billion new urban residents unless we create that new space. Now, a more provocative question or assertion that I'll make is that it, when people in, in India ask me, well, what shall we do to fix Mumbai? My answer to them is, you should just put Mumbai on hold for two or three decades and think about creating space like the space in, in Manhattan where millions of people can move into cities in, in India who can't move into Mumbai right now and do that over and over again all over Idi India so that there is this new space to move into. Eventually, you could come back and think about uh, trying to do something in Mumbai. And if there isn't quite so much pressure to move there, then it'll be easier to fix. But the key point is, is that a dollar spent uh, or a rupee spent trying to tinker in Mumbai right now will have very little payoff. But a, a rupee spent planning for a framework that can allow billions of new uh, residents in these newly developed areas, that can have an extremely high payoff, and that's where governments should be focused right now. Thank you very much for those very, very thought-provoking remarks, and as I say, we're about to pick up on them in our panel discussion, so I greatly appreciate it. And as you can see, our chair movers were uh, achieving a great logistical uh, uh, success here and nearly silently at that. So I can now ask our other panelists to join us as I introduce them by name. And I begin with Katil Solvik Olsen. He is Minister of Transport and Communications of Norway. He served three parliamentary terms representing Rogaland for Denmark's Progress Party. And he's well acquainted with the financial pressures that cities face having served as deputy member of Oslo's Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. A warm welcome to you. Please do join us. And you will find your place uh, there in the middle. Thank you very much. And it's my pleasure to introduce Christian Bowen. He is Chile's Vice Minister of Transport. Prior to his work with the ministry, he was a partner at Neonair Renewable Energy Company and also served as counsel to various parliamentary blocs of the Chilean Congress in the area of transport and telecommunications. As many of you know, Santiago de Chile has undertaken an ambitious urban transport reform, and we're going to be hearing more on that shortly. Welcome to you. <laughs> Pleased to see you. And it is my pleasure to introduce Sir Peter Hendy. He is Commissioner of Transport for London. He planned and led the successful operation of London's transport for the 2012 Olympics and Paralympic Games. He was formerly in management with two of London's leading bus lines, and he was elected president of the International Public Transport Association, UITP, in 2013. He was appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2006 for his work in keeping public transport in London running during the 2005 London bombings. A very warm welcome to you, Sir Peter. <laughs> Hello. It's my pleasure to introduce Rufino H. Leon Tovar. He is Minister of Transportation and Roads in the Mexico City government. Before that, he was General Director of the Electrical Transport Service of Mexico City, and he also served as Director General of Legal Affairs at the Ministry of Social Development. Social inclusion was a key aim of Mexico City's award-winning Metrobus system, and I'm sure he'll tell us more in just a moment. Welcome to you, sir.
my pleasure to introduce now Pierre Francesco Maran. He is Deputy Mayor for Mobility, Environment, Subways, Public Water, Energy in the City of Milan, which of course is this year's winner of the ITF Transport Achievement Award. He became City Councilor of Milan in 2006, and he is the youngest member of the Council, as I understand it. He's also the author of a proposal for a night bus network, recently approved during Milan's last administration, and he serves as president of the ICS Car Sharing Initiative. Welcome to you, Mr. Moran. Mr. Evgeny Adamov is head department head, uh, depa sorry, deputy head of the Department for Transport and Road Infrastructure Development for the city of Moscow. Moscow, as you all may know, is embarking on an ambitious effort to transform the urban environment. Its chief architect says it is the beginning of an effort to humanize the city. And again, we'll hear more on that in just a moment. A very warm welcome to Evgeny Adamov. <laughs> and finally, Helle Sorholt is a co-founder and CEO of Gale Architects. Based in Copenhagen, it is renowned for its award-winning work in urban design and urban development. Ms. Soholt has led and facilitated large-scale change processes in cities throughout the world, and she describes her planning model as values-based and centered on people. And as I discovered doing my research, you have advised many of the cities on our panel. So uh, we'll be hoping to get some feedback from you. A warm welcome also please to Tele Sorholt. <laughs> and we're also very much looking forward to hearing from you, ladies and gentlemen, a little bit later on in our session. We're going to begin in a dialogue format and we're looking forward to getting into dialogue with you as well later on. So let me begin to start with uh, His Excellency Minister Sovik Olsen. Your capital has a very ambitious plan to become more livable, in the words of our title, more sustainable in many of the ways that Mr. Roma highlighted. I was in Oslo recently. I was impressed by its beauty, but I was also impressed by the fact that actually I didn't see that many cyclists on the road, certainly not in comparison to the city where I live, Berlin. Now, what I read later was that just 6% of trips are made by bicycle, and I wonder if that takes us back to the last comments that were made by Mr. Roma, that it can be very difficult to refit and repurpose older cities. Oslo is dense, it's old. Um, does that make your work hard in trying to translate those big ambitions into practice? Well, it's a, it's a very good point. Uh, it would be easier if we could start all fresh, lay out the plans, knowing the modern uh, means of transportation, how high we can build the buildings and things like that. And uh, we do have eager goals on the having more people move about, about by walking or riding the bicycles. But it is a challenge when you have a densely uh, or narrow uh, streets. How do you find room both for the buses because we do want to have a good public transportation. We are, uh, we do have a lot of people commuting from long ways away, and you don't have public transportation for all of them, so some people will be driving their cars. And at the same time, you do, you do want more of the folks living in the city to walk around or ride the bikes. So just in the narrow constraints betwe the, between the buildings is, is a, a problem. The other thing is that our climate, Make, makes uh, a lot of people uh, during summertime walking is a good thing, riding a bicycle a good thing. During wintertime it's cold, it's snowy, it doesn't invite you to, to ride the bike. So you may have a climate that makes habits that uh, makes you more comfortable driving a car, riding a bus, and when summertime comes you're so used to being driven around instead of biking that you don't change. And th the last part is also that a lot of Norwegians will be looking to Denmark, to Amsterdam, to Berlin, saying, oh, it would be nice to have a bicycling culture like you do in those cities. But you also look at the kind of bikes you have. In Norway, most folks will be riding around in terrain bikes because it's so hilly. In Copenhagen, it's so flat, you can have your bicycle uh, city bike with your uh, cargo thing in the front of the, of the steering wheel. And in Norway, riding the bike to work means that you usually have to take a shower when you get there. So <laughs> when people look at, should I ride my bike and add the time for a shower, or should I ride my car even though there's traffic jam? A lot of people will say, well, it's more comfortable to sit in the traffic jam because at least I don't have to shower when I get there. 
So that's why we have to look at the infrastructure, both make the public transportation more uh, dependable, more uh, frequent, and we have to see how we can use modern technology to make biking easier. And the development we see with electric-powered bikes now, uh, it's, it's, I think that's going to make a breakthrough. So the next time you come to Norway, you may see a lot more people riding the bike because when you go uphill, you don't make a sweat because you get aid from the electric power. Electric bikes also, of course, a good response to the demographic challenges that many northern European societies face. Let me come to Chile's vice minister, um, Mr. Bowen, and ask about some of what we heard from Paul Roma in terms of frameworks and the rights-based approach which they apply, imply. How do we ensure that all citizens have a right to make their needs and their wishes heard and that we don't wind up with two class or more class solutions when it comes to urban planning and transport? Yeah. Hi. Uh, well, first of all, Melinda asked me before to be on time in my answer, so I told her that I would prefer to speak Spanish in order to, to be on time. So we had an agreement before, and so you maybe need to use, just use your earphones. Get us one moment, give everybody one moment to do that, if you For would, sure. please. Um, so I'll lead the way here, and if I manage the technology, For I'm sure they can do it too. For <laughs> sure. Uh, primero que todo, First of all, it is important to understand that if we want to create a livable city that is pleasant and that invites you to take a walk, we need to know who we are doing it for. And the citizens or the people to whom we propose public policy and sustainable development are the ones that are, should be the target of all our policies, that should be in the center always. We have frameworks, as Professor Roma said, which are essential for the timely development. But there are also social issues that change. Particularly nowadays, we are facing a situation which is, is probably unique and which has only arisen in the past few years. On the one hand, there is intercommunication because everything that happens nowadays on one place in the world is known on other places of the world the next day. There's Twitter, there's Facebook, there's all kinds of social media. And on this basis, a society can organize itself quicker and better. There are also communities that are very dissatisfied. We have just faced an economic crisis and we have mentioned this on this summit as well. And therefore, there is economic imbalance and no equity of opportunities. On the contrary, the gap has widened and sometimes the level has stayed as it was in the past and it was never very equal. Therefore, we have faced many challenges and for the governments it's also an important and critical time. We have to regain the confidence in institutions through transparency. All that means that we have to work more efficient. There are many protests from the public and also many movements, for example, the Indignados movement. And we need public policies that have to be developed. That means that the community, the people, have to be taken on board when planning, when developing political strategies from the beginning to the end. And if we don't promote participation, we won't achieve that. We won't achieve a society that incorporates wishes and opportunities that exist in the community. The cities have to be built up and for that we need a framework, a network that cannot only be provided by technicians and academics. We need agreements with the cities, with the communities we have to talk to those who live in the individual quarters of the cities and it has to be a participative process and the government has to balance and weigh these processes. Example of how you are doing that in Chile, um, a concrete example showing the way that that can work in practice. For sure. Uh, Whatever well, language you like. <laughs> we're, we are going to, to announce 
I, I guess in the next 15 this days or the next month, the creation of one commission uh, for uh, creating solutions in many cities in Chile about uh, uh, solutions for mobility and uh, reducing congestions in our cities that are developing and as they are developing, people have more money and they buy cars and they want to use this right to freedom of uh, use of our, of our roads. Uh, so uh, the point is that we are creating these commissions, but these uh, are commissions that are not going to be uh, constituted only by professors, but also by people of the social civil, uh, social civil groups. And uh, we're going to create uh, groups with participation of the community. And our idea is to get agreements about which measures we should take in every different city in our country. So we're going to receive these, these ideas, we're going to work that ideas, and to create this framework, this common ground, and we're going to develop these measures. And the benefit of this is that people are going to have agreements before of the implementation of our, the measures of anti-congestion. Uh, but at the same time, we are going to get information from these communities about best solutions, because we can't know every single thing that is happening in all the cities or in, in, our, in the whole planet. So when we get this information, when we give information, we also have measures that can be uh, more subject to accountability because if the communities they know what we are, are what do we agree, did what we did agree before, uh, they are going to be more um, informed about the the goals and after that the go the officials should be more uh, in the public opinion uh, palestra or place. So uh, finally, we are going to have a more effective and a more uh, important and participative process of creating frameworks, of creating common grounds, and for, with this, uh, facing the problem of traffic congestion. So a couple of themes I hear emerging here so far. The need for participation to get urban planning transformation. Also, the need for data-based planning, really knowing what users want and need. And then also the need to change patterns of expectation along the lines that Paul Romer mentioned, saying people have a perceived right, if they've been doing it for quite a while, to drive on any street at any time, perceived right to park a car. So let's stay with the idea of changing those patterns of expectations. And I'd like to ask you, uh, Sir Peter Hendy, in regard to London, um, clearly you did change patterns of behavior during the Olympics. There was a very astonishing collective effort that absolutely redu reduced congestion and motorization by very high percentages. It seems like you're going to need an initiative of equally Olympian proportions to face congestion in future. Transport for London recently reported that by 2031, congestion in central London will worsen by 60% even if you do all the things that you have planned to do in your new transport strategy investment program. That sounds pretty daunting. You do need a microphone. No. Here you go. So, uh, so the Olympic effort is very special because people have a reason to change if you explain uh, what's going on in the city. Um, and uh, I think we did explain it. We explained it in a modern information age when people could access uh, knowledge about their specific alternatives. Uh, and it was very successful. I think we've learned from uh, that sort of active travel management that you can persuade people to change their habits if there's a reason for it. Um, but I'm not sure that in the city of 2020 or 2030 that you can do that to the extent to which people will uh, really change their lives uh, unless their employers and unless the framework of how they go about their business changes too. Now, the modern city, at least the modern uh, c c city of London, is changing in the sense that actually it's, beca it's become a 24-hour city. More people are working, are able to work different hours. So from that point of view, there's flexibility. Um, I, I suppose my bigger answer to that point is that we, I mean, we, we're 
we are predicting increases in congestion, but we're also promoting solutions to it. And the most astonishing thing for me is that we've been sitting here for half an hour and nobody has mentioned mass transit because, in fact, there is no opportunity in any city in the developed or the developing world for people to move about on the road, it, 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 on the road space in vehicles of any sort uh, with a city of any density uh, without causing extreme congestion. And that's the reason for mass transit. Um, and it's the reason why mass transit has to be a feature of city development. Uh, and it's the reason why, if you look at London, uh, as fast as we can, as fast, fast as we're able to fund it, we're bu building mass transit, uh, additional mass transit routes, modifying the systems we have got, increasing their capacity, because it's absolutely essential. And, and for our city, which is an old, uh, an old street network, which is completely uh, improbably likely to ever be, um, be manipulable for any degree of uh, demand for vehicles, then carrying on with mass transit is obviously one feature. The other features, which I think goes back to the, uh, to the discussion about Times Square, is that actually a modern city ought to be dense enough for people to walk and cycle around it uh, without using, without using uh, motorised vehicles. And, and in fact, that's going to be, that is going to be a feature of London because London is constrained by a green belt uh, and, and I don't think there's anybody who doesn't think that it's, as it moves to nine or 10 million people, um, that we don't have to have much denser housing, we don't have to have, to have much denser employment. And the consequence of that is that actually people ought to be able to do more walk walking and cycling. And in fact, that's good, good for them too. Our plans have always had more road user charging in them. Uh, the question with that is not whether it's technically feasible, but whether it's politically feasible. Uh, we have a scheme that, is uh, that was found to be political, politically feasible 10 years ago, which works very successfully. But whether you can impose that in outer London is different. But you have to offer people choices, I think. And the choices that you must offer them are mass transit in a city of several million people because people do need to do need to exploit mobility and indeed with modern information techniques having all of it at their fingertips about how you get to places and where you can go and I think one of the features I'd just wind up and say is that actually if you look at the uh, at London the people who are coming to London are disproportionately young and disproportionately economically active but those people of my son's generation actually interestingly are showing much less interest in being able to drive because they can't keep a car, there's nowhere to put one, they're very expensive, uh, they cause congestion, you can't really use them very effectively, uh, why would you do it? Their, their model of city living doesn't include driving, right. and I think that's really helpful, and I think if I, if I want to be controversial, I, I think that's, that's, that's complete, the complete antithesis of this sort of mad Silicon Valley idea that we'll all be moving about in automated cars. Um, you mentioned Mumbai, and uh, a city with an, a crush loading standard on its suburban trains of 14 to 16 people per square meter is never likely to move on four-wheeled vehicles and be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And may I just rise to the Minister's defense? He did mention public transport. He pointed out that not everybody can ride a bike. Um, <laughs> so I will now move on to Mr. Tovar of Mexico. If I look at Mexican transport policy, it seems to be going in two very different and almost opposing directions. You've still got a very car-dominated public road system. By far and away, the largest share of users on the public roads are private cars. Car use is also still rising. And nearly half of your budget in transport is dedicated to expanding road constructions, including a new two-tiered highway model. On the other hand, there's Metrobus, award-winning program of public urban transportation. So can you reconcile that apparent paradox for us? And we are going to hear Spanish again, so. Well, yes, uh, thank you very much. It's the first time that Mexico is presented in this forum, and I want to thank you for the invitation to be here. Now, for Mexico, we can say that the city has been built for cars, indeed, and at the last time we have slightly changed our direction. We have uh, adjusted our mobility pyramid as it stands. And 
we tried to change the mobility patterns of the city. And we are one of the largest cities. We've got almost 20 million people living in Mexico City, and 60% of the traffic runs over public transport, while only 40% would really be carried out by private vehicles. Throughout the last decades, we have made efforts to improve mobility in Mexico City. We have carried out investments into the infrastructure. And, by the way, we also revived the bicycle and attached new value to it. And we have uh, established uh, 10 of these fast track bus lines which can carry 800,000 people every day. We've got a metro, which is able to move 5 million people every day. We've got an electric bus system, which complements the metro. And we've got also conventional buses running on our streets and roads, which also can transport a high number of passengers. Now, this is the entire context. Uh, this is the way how we change and adapt. We've carried out public investments and invested public money so that people can use their cars in a better manner. This is one of our uh, objectives. We have extended our public road system. We have uh, 4,000 public bicycles which are on offer to be used by citizens and 30,000 uh, rides would be done per day with these bicycles. Uh, for the mayor of the city of Mayor, uh, for the city of Mexico, it's important to pay much attention to transport. And our overarching objective is to develop an integrated transport system. We talk to uh, our citizens about a culture of mobility. We want to have uh, less cars on our roads in the future. We want to achieve that everybody has access to transport and public transport. And I can also say that uh, one goal of our investment is that citizens can benefit from the public transportation system. We can say that this system, this public transport network, has been uh, upgraded. Standards have been upgraded uh, to such an extent that we can achieve a higher and offer a higher quality for passengers. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned comprehensive solutions, because that certainly is a point I'd like to pick up a little bit later in talking about what else do we have to transform if we want to transform transport? But let me now go to Milan, which uh, of course has also, like Mexico City and indeed like Moscow, uh, suffered horrific traffic jams in the past. Paul Romer reminded us that congestion charges, and of course Milan won its Transport Achievement Award for a congestion charge that it has adopted. Congestion prices may be politically unacceptable, he told us, if they are proposed too late in the game. But you had enormous public support for your congestion charge. How? How did you, how did you get that? Well, <coughs> well it depends uh, on the period, uh, to be true, because um, our congestion charge uh, was uh, born by a public referendum that was after the city election in 2011, where most of the people said yes to uh, five referendums on uh, uh, mobility, on sustainable mobility, and on environment. It was uh, on uh, um, June 2011. We spent the autumn to discuss with citizens, with more than 100 of association and categories, which rules uh, uh, to put on the congestion charge we were going to introduce. Uh, in January, we started the new uh, congestion charge, so just six months from the referendum to the realization of the policies. As people voted 
uh, for the referendum in June, I would say that uh, on January when we start, uh, it was not that easy as uh, it was on June. Uh, because there were protests, uh, probably, I don't know why, citizens don't think that the politician will do what they promise. So they thought we promised the congestion charge, but we will not realize it. So in the first weeks, it was quite hard for us to explain what we were doing. But when the congestion charge began, the mood of citizens changed again because they saw the results of the congestion charge. From one day to the next, the traffic was reduced of more than 30%, and now it's still 28% less than before. Milan for TomTom Tom Europe Index in 2010 was the 10th most congested city of Europe. Now, after two years, is out of the 20 most congested city of Europe. Something is really changed. Uh, the public transport, the bus transport speed increased of the 6%. The car accident decreased of 24%. Even outside the congestion charge area, traffic was reduced by 7%. And we used the money we earned by the congestion charge to pay the service of the new subway line it was open last year and to double the bike sharing system that now takes 200 bike stations. Well, of course, uh, uh, it was uh, not easy, and, uh, uh, but uh, we, uh, we had always a part of the city, most of the part of the city, uh, the say the poll, that uh, um, was in favor of this politics. Now we are doing something more because, uh, okay, congestion charge is there, but citizens say, then what's next? And so uh, we are trying to face uh, the main problem of our city, that is the fact that uh, 10 years ago there were 65 cars for 100 inhabitants. Now the situation is a little better, it's 55, but it's, it's uh, too much compared to the situation of other large European cities. And it is uh, difficult in order to create a new pedestrian area, new bike lines, new bus lines. So we introduced uh, a car sharing system, and in the last uh, six months, we moved from 100 car sharing car to 1,500 cars, from 5,000 subscribers to 100,000 subscribers. In order to say citizen that uh, we are convincing them to use uh, less uh, car, not only uh, with restriction like a congestion charge, but also with the new opportunities. And even the protest uh, was uh, an opportunity for a large scale debate on the city on how we move in Milan. And in the last two years, uh, the number of people that su subscribe our monthly or annual pass of public transport was increased of uh, 25%. So something is changing. This month, we introduced a new pedestrian area around uh, the uh, castle of the city, Castello Sforzesco, that. Uh, say what is the second phase of uh, a congestion charge. So to rescue space for citizens, for new pedestrian area, and that is something we hope uh, you will see, especially if you come to visit Milan during World Exposition on, of the next year. Thank you very much. So a couple of more elements to put into our mix of uh, what you need to have. Clearly, that linkage to broader aims, again, comprehensive solutions, but making a clear linkage to things people do want, like more park space. And then uh, secondly, quick and visible results. Yesterday in a panel, I was told that politicians like to do things that get success quickly because then they get reelected. And uh, clearly this was good for you and good for the citizens as well. <laughs> Let me move on now to the city of Moscow. A statistic I found there rather shocking. Residents of Moscow lose eight days a year thanks to congestion, sitting in traffic, eight days a year. Um, you recently also have introduced parking charges. What are they achieving, and how are they being received by citizens? Have you had a positive uh, response, or are you finding it hard to change behavior? And here we're going to have a uh, Russian, so again, headphones. Спасибо. <coughs> Я абсолютно согласен с коллегами, предыдущими коллегами, которые выступали. I totally agree to what my colleagues said. 
uh, everything we do is for the people, for the citizens. And that means in the first place that when it comes to implementing any project, we first need to turn to people and ask them what their attitude is. If we don't have the support of our citizens, we can't implement projects of that kind. We have developed a program in Moscow, uh, a strategic development plan for the development of transport in the city in which we uh, spelled out objectives. One of the main objective is to reduce the usage of private cars by 33% until the year 2020. Now, that is a very ambitious goal. That's true. But we need to achieve that by increasing the public transport's capacities. Part of the strategy is also to use tools like the development of park spaces and or rather parking spaces. We have uh, introduced a parking charge system in the center of the city. And before the introduction of that system, we discussed these affairs in the departments of uh, the city government. And we also talked to stakeholders, those who were affected by these measures. And uh, we talked to them at the sides of pilot projects. We had heated debates about these charges. And people were full of mistrust, wondering whether this would really be beneficial for them. And they were very much concerned. Why? should they have to pay money for a parking space just in front of their own uh, house, in front of the building where they lived. So in the beginning, we provided one free of charge parking space where they lived. And everybody who travels to the city center from other districts have to pay if they want to park a car there. And the first results of surveys that we have made show us that 52% of the inhabitants of these districts have understood the mes message and the measure and uh, proved that there were some who were uncertain of, in terms of what to think of it, and 23% objected. After the introduction of the parking charge, the city center Uh, the traffic uh, in the uh, city center was decreased by 20%. There were 20% less cars that used public space for parking purposes. And people got demotivated in terms of using their own car to travel into the city center. Uh, now, uh, currently, people have to pay one euro per hour of parking. And uh, people now travel to the city center and leave it as fast as they can in order to keep their charges low. Now, in order to limit traffic in the city center, we have built up park and ride facilities close to metro station. People can take the subway to travel into the city center and leave their cars further away from the city center. This is a very successful system. It works very well. And you know that we've got a radial system in Moscow where we have the Sadovi ring, we have the Boulevard ring. Uh, these are concentric rings around the city center. And Outside of the inner city center, we already have developed uh, commercial centers, shopping centers, malls there, which also take away some of the burden that formerly had been pressing onto the city center. There is an organization which manages these parking charges in Moscow. And this organization uh, has installed CCTV facilities for parking places. Any kind of misconduct would be recorded and passed on. 
and fines are levied, of course, for those who wouldn't have paid their parking charge. People have come to understand that they cannot avoid this system. They don't get parking for free. And we're going to continue this system with the support of the population, of the citizens, with the support of the members of the City Council and the City Parliament. And we're very confident with regard to the future, future success of the measure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Finally, I'd like to come to Helle Soholt. You, of course, work in and have helped to shape a city that is just a role model of livability. Forty percent of the people traveling around Copenhagen are on bikes or foot. But Copenhagen is small, it's dense, and it is deeply, deeply influenced, of course, by its old Northern European culture. Now, you work advising cities, as I mentioned, several of the cities on this panel, including Mexico and Moscow. How do you apply lessons from such a unique environment as Copenhagen to these incredibly different urban environments? Well, first of all, um, I, I think we the, um, that have leadership that is ready to work in different ways, uh, cities that are ready to deal with integrated solutions and to use people data in their evidence-based approach uh, to process. And um, so it's much more to do with methodology or approach and leadership than it has to do with scale of city, in my view. Um, also, I would say we forget that Copenhagen has also been a car-dominated city. Back in the 50s and 60s, we had uh, cars uh, dominating all of our streets and squares. So the transformation that Copenhagen has been through uh, is something that we can uh, definitely um, talk about in other cities and learn from as an example. Tell us something about the kind of advice that you gave to Mexico City and to Moscow, if you would. Well, I think um, I'm, I'm, very, uh, I, I'm very pleased to hear a lot of the things that are being said, both on this panel, but also in general, I would say, at this forum. I was at the ITF uh, forum for the first time a couple of years ago, and I would just applaud uh, the, the whole refocusing on cities. And, and on the environment and on the social impact of, uh, of transport and mobility, uh, which has taken place over these past couple of years since I was last here. Uh, when we work in, in uh, large and small cities, our approach is very much to look at cities as both a software and a hardware situation. I deal as a designer, of course, with how we actually design the framework that uh, our keynote speaker was talking about uh, initially. But uh, we cannot design that space without actually taking into equation the, the, the local culture and, and, and how it's actually used. I think it's uh, fantastic in Copenhagen that we have built, we have been able to build the culture over the past 40 to 50 years a sustainable culture. And today, um, people don't uh, use a car, and a lot of people don't even own a car. And that's not because they cannot afford it. It's not because they wouldn't like to have a car, but it's basically because they don't need it. And it's, this, it, it's, it's back to the, the, the point of, uh, of uh, uh, in, in regards to London, I very much agree that if we have dense enough urban centers, people people shouldn't be uh, needing to use their car, but actually should be able to, to, to walk and cycle uh, in these environments. I, I'm very concerned about how can cities leapfrog? Uh, how can we actually make integrated systems from the beginning? Mm -hmm. Why is it that uh, so many of the developing cities have to go through the same pain that the rest of the Western society has been through? where we have to learn uh, through, uh, through, through 20, 30, 40 years that we cannot develop mobility systems as, um, with, with focus on only one vehicle um, and one type of system. It has to be integrated from the beginning. So that is really uh, what concerns me. To me, freedom is not to have the right to own a car. Freedom is actually to have a range of opportunity and choices within a city that supports your way of life. 
Um, I would just mention a, a few things. We had a, a masterclass yesterday morning on designing cities for people, which was a new format that uh, I was invited to by, by OECD. And um, we had a few questions uh, that, that was discussed in that session. And just to make three points. First of all, I think people were discussing the use of data that we have had a lot of focus on the last couple of days. And in order to use data, we actually need to understand how, how the demands of cities are changing. Uh, one of the points that came out was that populations are aging, for example. So we, we don't even know the demands of, uh, of our future uh, citizens 10 or 20 years from now. So that's something to, to take into account. We also asked the participants uh, yesterday morning, what is the one thing that you would wish to do when you come back on, on work on Monday? Or what is it that you would do to enable that wish? And there was a couple of comments that came out of that. Um, one comment was to help enable transport planning and design of solutions to align with multimodal policies that already is, exists. And a second comment I found was equally important. Select study areas, select the small places, the key places within the city, whether it's the city center, different communities, districts, certain streets. Select those places where we can test those new solutions and interact with people in order to measure the impacts and then learn from those examples and scale it up from there. Thank you very much. I'm mindful that we want to get to audience questions in just a moment, but I know that the minister will have to leave us a little bit earlier. So I'd like to pose one more brief question to you and a couple of others about linkages, starting with the question of integrated comprehensive solutions and ask you if we want to transform transport to make cities more livable, what other sectors have to be linked to that? What does a comprehensive solution look like quite concretely? How do you do it? Well, the way we have approached it in Norway, I think, has to do with some of what uh, also Professor Romer said. We, we need to have flexible solutions. We need to set aside land so that we actually have room for that. There's some of the struggles we have now that we see that when we need to expand the highways, because we need to have more buses on the roads, when we want to expand the ra railroads so that we have two tracks instead of one, uh, you're already built on those uh, land, and it's expensive to buy it back. So uh, we see that in parts of, of, of around Oslo, it's, it's almost cheaper to build tunnels because it would be costing more to buy the land to tear down the houses and build the roads, even though building roads in the open air is cheaper, but buying the land is more expensive. Um, so planning ahead is, is a good thing. Of course, as I stressed in, in my initial remark, when we, you have an older city, Norway, uh, you have to live with the constraints that you already have, and we also want to preserve our cultural heritage. Now, the way we have approached this is we have formed what we call urban environmental packages, meaning that we have three uh, regulatory uh, levels in Norway. We have the national government, you have regional, and you have the local government. The national government has responsibility of the highways, the railroads. The uh, regional government has uh, public transportation. The local government often had the area planning, you know, the housing, uh, how you set up the community. Now we want to approach this saying that the government, the national government will provide more funds for infrastructure investments if the local governments kind of set up a deal on how they're gonna use their areas. Meaning that when we put up new railway stations, when we put up bus stops, the local government is committed to also make more densely populated areas around that. So you, ha you need kind of city planning around each of the train stops. Because if we're going to have the frequency and the reliability on the public transportation that makes it attractive enough for people to ride trains instead of riding the car, you need to be able to take the train every 10, 15 minutes instead of waiting an hour between every time you can approach it. And for doing that, you need to have more people living around a certain area so that they can walk or bike to, to the train station. And uh, Norway, you know, all of Norway has five, five and a half million people. So we are a different situation than most of the big cities we're talking about, but still 
the Oslo region has the same constraints, the same problem that in rush hour traffic, the, 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 um, the slowdown in traffic is worse in some of the Norwegian cities, even though they're smaller than in some of the big cities, because this, the, the size of the infrastructure it's existing today is also so small, because it's dimensioned for a small city. With the growth of Norway now population-wise, economically, it's putting a strain on this. So these urban environmental packages, we think, is a big solution or, or a big part of the solution to, to doing this. So both the investment in, in, in within city infrastructure, but also uh, increased in investment in between city uh, railroad is kind of, we hope that this is gonna work together so that less people will use the car even if they own one because it's going to be more comfortable riding the public transportation and with modern telecommunication technology i think a lot of people will want to sit on the train using their ipads being on social media reading the newspaper using the email so we also have to invest in telecommunication infrastructure uh, at the same time thank you very much so linkage to other sectors very crucial there can i briefly ask about a larger kind of a linkage, and that's namely to politics itself. In so many cities, decisions around construction, around planning of infrastructure or transport are made in relation to power and patronage. And I wonder, Vice Minister, do we have to break through those kind of entrenched political systems and interests in order to transform planning for transport? Let me answer this in Spanish again. So, it's like a... Yes, there is a simple answer to the question. The time has come in which it has become necessary to change mindsets and to develop a policy, a public policy. We have made different experiences. We've heard about these experiences where progress has been made, but we also have to see it in reference to the citizens and we have to work together with the citizens. For example, with a referendum or a local movement or a meeting with the citizens where we can explain public policy. Or we can use big data, we can use technological opportunities, the internet, to, potent, uh, to multiply participation and before a measure is implemented, before a policy is implemented, we can reach a larger consensus and, for example, if we build a parking space in Moscow where you have to pay for parking or when we develop a road network in Mil Milan, we have to know that we have won over the majority of the population for this measure. The Americans call it quick wins. I don't think it's the best solution. I think you have to win the population for your idea in order to avoid a failure after three months. And I think we also have to demonstrate leadership. Sometimes it is not easy to reach agreements. Sometimes you don't reach an agreement at all. And the political um, class has to ex ex execute leadership. How do we do it? How can we pave the way? How can we show people how important it is to use public transport to develop sustainable cities? We have to show them how their districts can be developed, how their quality of life can improve not only for themselves but also for others. If we achieve that and if the political class understands how important collaboration with the citizens is and how important it is to lead these processes to create truly livable cities for the people who live there and for the people who live on our planet, then things will change. I would like to go now to audience questions, but I think that I will allow the minister to leave us first because I know that you have a plane to make. So let us please give a very warm round of applause to the minister, but we will then take audience questions. So uh, we're going to let only you leave. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us. It was a pleasure. So if you have a question, would you please raise your hand? And um, we do have microphones, which will be brought around you. I'm going to take a couple of questions at a time. And do tell us who you are, please. So we have one here, and then we have one over there. Yeah. 
Go ahead. John Riley, I would like to understand with all the people living locally in, in the cities uh, with, and shopping locally and getting their food local from, from uh, metro stores, small stores in the cities, how are we going to get that food to those stores so they can be bought there? Uh, because they've got to deliver now at, silently, they clean machines, etc. A couple of examples I would really appreciate on how we get food into the, the big cities. Do you have a particular person you would like to answer that question? Uh, I think if, if one of the very big cities like Mexico or, or, uh, would, would be, or Mox, Moscow would be really appreciated. Okay, thank you. We'll yeah. take that in just a moment. I'm going to get a couple more questions first. I have one over here. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Osama Freja. I'm from the state of Qatar. Uh, I have a question. I know um, typically, I am actually a traffic engineer by um, discipline. So typically we go to the source of the issue. A lot of the uh, speakers have spoke about good things that has been done in some of the cities. But I have not heard anybody speaking what is really the issue, why people are driving. Our experience tells us that most of the time starts with the land use. I know today is about transport. Uh, but I've heard actually some of the speakers speaking also about maybe residential being created in some of the cities. But what measures uh, is being taken to convince people to live within those cities where you intensify them? What measures that's being done to make sure that the people live, work, and entertain within the city area and they're not living outside and then they're driving? And then on the top of that, we all know that, that when you intensify, the cost of land goes up, the cost of, uh, you know, to live in those cities goes up, and none of us as the middle age or the young professionals, which they make majority of the employment within that city, can live within that city parameters, so we move outside. And then we end up driving back again. So now we're trying to come up with a solution to a problem that was created by land use. Again, what measures are those cities are taking to ensure that the land use is really protected and it's the right land use that make people really stay within that city and they live, okay. work, and entertain within Thank that you. area and affordable Thank housing. Thank you. You can hand your microphone to the man uh, just two seats away and we'll just take that one too and then we'll get some answers. Yes. Uh, my name is André Brotou from Vinci, but beside my work I, am, I belong to World Road Association and we make studies on uh, megacities. Uh, a megacity is not only a city center, but also a lot of suburbs, a lot of different cities, which constitute the urban area, or more or less the commuting areas. Area, 80%, generally speaking, 80% of the workforce lives outside of the city center. Those people do a lot of kilometers to go to work, and if we speak not in number of journeys, but in number of passenger kilometer, the commuting uh, journeys represent more than 50% of the total demand of mobility. My question is, what about the need of those people? Because I think we cannot have a livable city without a livable urban area. Thank you very much. So let me start out by getting a response to the first, but also more questions, if you would like, from Mexico City. Um, getting the food to the people if we're you know, not going to let vehicles uh, come into the city anymore, and then also address, if you like, how do we deal with the needs of those who live outside the city and are coming in? What about re-urbanization uh, and so on? Sí, sí, de acuerdo. Eh, debo, en principio debemos entender que la carga, más allá de un tema de movilidad, eh, implica un tema de competitividad urbana. En Ciudad de México eh, tenemos implicaciones eh, de manera local de la movilidad. Well, we have to take a look at a variety of factors. We see repercussions onto the periphery of cities. The burden can be observed on the, not only in the center of cities, but also in the outer areas of cities and in the rest of the country around it. Mm. We have uh, sat together with the transportation associations of the country and discussed how 
transport could be managed on the basis of agreements to be concluded. And then we just had to determine at which point in time trucks were allowed to enter cities so they, they wouldn't get there at peak times further adding to the congestion. And then we also discussed which type of transport, which mode of transport to be used. That was a first stage of discussions that we have initiated. We also developed a new law for mobility within the city boundaries. And there is also a general mobility strategy in place for Mexico. In a second phase then, after that, uh, we looked at those centers which have a high uh, traffic load and we used technologies there and introduced technologies which are most environmentally friendly in order to facilitate the transport of food into these areas. I wonder, Sir Peter Hendy, uh, if you can tell us a little bit about some of the innovative things that London did in terms of transport of um, food and other necessary materials because as I remember that those were some of the initiatives that were taken during the Olympics to try to really change delivery structures and patterns. So I think it's a really good question because actually if you ask in, a, in, in any city of any size uh, maybe how the road system should be used then the distribution of goods and services is probably um, a more essential element than actually the movement of people certainly in, in individual vehicles. Um, what we found, uh, and I think there'll be uh, other sessions in this uh, forum where it's demonstrated, is that the, uh, the logistics industry is in, in fact um, very resilient, very efficient, uh, and very uh, amenable to suggestions about uh, doing things in a better way. And we found uh, that actually they needed to interact with their customers, a lot of fresh food distribution is in fact not limited by the distributors, by the distributors, it's limited by the refrigeration capacity of the places that you send it to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we found that people, if they invested in more refrigeration, could have nighttime deliveries of food for the following day. I think probably less satisfactorily, and certainly something that needs to be addressed worldwide in cities in the next 10 to 15 years, is not the bringing in of food and, uh, and, and other materials of that sort, but the distribution of things that people are increasingly buying through the internet. And that's a really interesting mm -hmm. problem because our roads are filling not with more cars, but with more small goods vehicles distributing parcels. Um, and in fact, most workplaces have more parcels delivered for the workforce than they do for the employer. Um, because that's how people live their lives. And I think actually that, that, that's, a solu that's a problem for which I don't yet have a solution, but we're thinking about it quite hard because actually the distribution of, of, of food, of beer, of uh, newspapers, of blood, whatever you suppose, it's actually quite efficient from a wholesale environment to a retail environment. It's the distribution of individual books, CDs, computers or whatever to people's addresses, which isn't. And I think one of the, uh, in the next 10 years, there'll be a lot of people sitting on platforms like this dis discussing how to resolve that issue. Actually, they did some discussion of that in our supply chains panel uh, this morning, uh, bearing in mind the fact that the master class actually said logistics vehicles ought to be banned from what I uh, <laughs> heard. Uh, let me ask who would like to address the other questions that we had about sprawl, getting people back into the cities, and what do we do about taking into account all of those who live within the exurbs? Would you like to take a shot at that, uh, Mr. Moran? Well, for, for our city at the moment, uh, the number of people uh, living inside the city and living outside the city are quite the same uh, in the last uh, 10 years uh, and probably will be similar for the next. What we are doing is uh, changing the scale of the institutions. We are moving from the city, that is 1.3 million inhabitants, uh, to the metropolitan area, that is uh, uh, more than 3 million inhabitants. This is... Uh, uh, we think a solution uh, to start uh, to govern uh, some uh, change, especially on transport, especially on energy, especially on, uh, on waste and recycling. Uh, this can be uh, even a solution to create uh, 
connected policies because uh, in the last uh, 20 years uh, the city created uh, public transport infrastructure, new subway lines, uh, while outside the city uh, the, we created uh, uh, highways especially because there were different uh, uh, goals from the city and from the region. We hope uh, that the new institution can create uh, a connection of goals in order to decide uh, a sustainab sustainable uh, um, uh, development of the area. Uh, as we reduce traffic inside the city, not only in the congestion charge area, we surely uh, not obtained large scale results in order to reduce the number of cars entering the city. There was a reduction, but it was a, a small one, one, two point percent in the last uh, two years. But uh, if uh, we start uh, thinking of the metropolitan area, that means that uh, we created a ticket system that is uh, in a large scale, not only in the city. That means that uh, uh, bus lines outside the city are connected to the train lines and instead of uh, creating a competition between the two systems, we think we can obtain some results. Hello, Soholt, it takes us back, I think, again to the question of how do we get that linkage to other areas of planning, like housing, uh, residential planning. What examples do you know of, briefly, uh, if you would, of successful programs to try to get people to move back in to cities? It's, it's difficult because it has to do with what I was talking about before, culture. We actually need to change the perception uh, in people's minds about what is a good life and what, how they would like to live. Um, in Sao Paulo, for the past uh, one and a half year, we've been engaged in a program where we are trying to uh, look at the old city center of the city, which is essentially uh, deteriorating uh, because a lot of the businesses have moved other places and only the, the um, municipal offices uh, and public offices are, are, are still, still within the city center. A lot of the retail has been deteriorating over time uh, and uh, essentially people have left the city center so that only we have now lots of empty, s empty buildings where only the gl ground floor is activated with pretty sort of low quality retail and the rest of the houses are, f are, are left for storage. Um, and even, so how do you, what do you do in a city like that? Um, what, what, what the strategy is that we have worked on together with the municipality in Sao Paulo is to basically revitalize the public spaces, the, the original framework, you could say, uh, discuss and debate the balancing act of how that framework is essentially designed and activate it and, and how it becomes, what are the qualities that we need to regain in, and, and how do we activate it? Um, we've tried to link those public spaces to important institutions such as universities, stations, and so forth, in order to be for people to get access to uh, to the area, and um, and then hopefully we th we we hope to transvert this uh, visual vicious spiral, you could say, to become a more positive spiral where the quality of public realm and activation of, of spaces can actually regain the trust in investments within the fantastic architectural framework which is there so that we can regain uh, residents to the city center and businesses coming back into the city center as well. Thank you very much. I'm very mindful of the fact that it is quite warm in this room, so perhaps I will now wind it up right there and suggest that those of you who did have questions that you didn't get to ask, find our speakers during the reception that we are all now invited to and perhaps continue the, the conversations in a more informal setting. Uh, so I will just say a very, very warm thanks to everybody on the panel for your very thought-provoking and interesting contributions. Many thanks. Many thanks to everybody in this very warm room for your attention and your participation. And also, could we please give a round of applause to the translators who are up there in even hotter little boxes working away. <laughs> and enjoy the reception. See you over in the glass hall where it's likely to be equally warm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.